You are listening to For the Fighter in You. We have a great show for you today, Mr. Sanjay Raja. Sanjay Raja has a very unique perspective on fitness and nutrition as his experience is in the field of medicine and as an athlete. He's an MMA fighter. Uh, Sanjay has over 10 years of experience working as a consultant with physicians and surgeons to help treat various disease states and educate surgeons on surgical techniques, brand new surgical techniques. He works with plastic surgeons, orthopedic surgeons, trauma, general and other specialties of surgery. Sanjay, it is a real pleasure uh, to, to have you on the show. You are a friend of mine. I should let everybody know you're a great guy um, and you're you were so knowledgeable in nutrition and in surgery. Uh, thanks for being on the show very much. I appreciate it, Jay. It's awesome. This is uh, I heard about the show uh, from you, and I was excited to hear that uh, you know my expertise was applicable to what you're doing. So it's awesome. It really is. Well, mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about yourself, Sanjay. Uh, how you get into health co uh, consultation and coaching. Uh, you know, it's very simple. I actually had a lot of weight issues growing up as a kid. You know, growing up as a kid in a very Indian household where meat was not allowed, especially my mom, who basically was a Jain uh, religion, which is more extreme form of Hinduism. So I was walking around as a 115-pound scrawny Indian kid in school, and <laughs> and you know, I had to put some meat on the bone, and uh, I was smaller than everybody else. Uh, you know, I, I wasn't getting the nutritional supplements through my daily diet, being that my mom was a hardcore vegetarian. So I strayed from the chosen path of Hinduism, and I decided that, you know, I'm in Kansas, and I need to eat some beef. So that's what I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a really, uh, I'm so glad we have you on the show, because you are on the razor's edge of the ongoing war that's taking place between the vegan community, vegetarian community, mm -hmm. and the paleo community. And they're, they're friends. I shouldn't make it out to be a There's plenty of us, and, and there's a lot of people who straddle the fence. Uh, and so it, I don't want to paint it like a war, but there's definitely a difference of opinion, and there are definitely two camps. Uh, and, you know, as a Hindu and someone from, from the Indian culture who is now, you know, eating meat, and I believe, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I believe a paleo uh, follower largely, Absolutely. you are the perfect guy to talk to about why someone might convert from vegetarianism to paleo. Well, you know, it's not so much a conversion, it's just augmenting what you're currently doing. I, you know, I don't believe in going too far left, too far right. There's always a great balance you can strike between the two. And um, it's funny, we're talking to friends in the community who are Indian, more and more of my generation and younger generation are being raised to eat meat. Um, it's, it's one of those things where it's unavoidable. It's a, it's a complex protein source. You know, if you get the organic stuff, like instead of eating beef, I go to buffalo now. It's antibiotic-free, hormone-free, or as free as possible from what we, you know, what we know to be bad for us. But um, it, culturally, there's a shift going on right now. You know, the vegetarian side, which is my, where I came from, my dad is a hardcore vegetarian. But guess what? At the age of 55 and above, he started eating meat. He needed to augment his protein source. So it's not a question of just religion, it's a question of health, body, and, you know, we've been hunting and gathering for millions of years, you know, hundreds of thousands of years, and uh, we can't turn that portion off just to live a strictly vegetarian diet, especially in this day and age when you know you need both the vegetarian, the meat sources, and you can find a healthy balance between the two. Yeah, and I guess the... the um critical question in this whole equation is do you feel better? You were a vegetarian for a long time. Obviously, your dad was. Mm -hmm. Do you feel better uh, eating meat and does your dad feel better eating meat? You know, uh, I feel now, I feel just healthy. I feel I've been, I'm in the best shape of my life at 37 versus when I was 17 years old, you know, 20 years later, but, uh, you know, you're never too late to start feeling good, and I, I can attribute to a number of things, and that is when I was a vegetarian, you ate a lot of carbohydrates, a lot of fried foods, a lot of things to augment, um, you know, what you were missing from your diet, but you didn't even think you were missing it, um, and I think where the obesity started for me was I couldn't bring meat home, 
So when I go out with my friends and go to McDonald's, I had to finish every meal. There was no t- doggy bag in my life. So <laughs> I would finish my meal at every restaurant, and I'd come home stuffed, just full of stuff. And then uh, my my mom, and you know, she'd be looking at me going, you ate meat today, right? And she would quarantine me in the next room, in fact. I couldn't be in the same room as her, you know. So, you know, just the fact that I could bring meat home and cook it and, you know, share it with my family and prepare it in such a way, it's a huge plus for me now. But uh, And I think we should clarify, too, when we're talking about meat here, and I think you and I are on the same page, we're not talking, I mean, yeah, 20 years ago you were eating McDonald's, but we're not talking about McDonald's. That is horrendous. What those Absolutely. patties are, you can't even call it food. What they yeah. do to those poor animals, you cannot call food. Absolutely. And, and, and tell me if we're on the same page here, but I believe you're talking about the same thing I'm talking about. You're talking about grass-fed buffalo, grass-fed venison uh, It's the, in its natural form. No antibiotics, no growth hormones, none of the junk that you get from agra, you know, the big agra lots. Those places are atrocious. No, and I'm glad you brought up that point because really to clarify, sustainable farming practices, we're talking about organic meat, we're talking about natural grass-fed, just as you mentioned before, you know, the organic grocery stores are popping up more and more everywhere right now, and it, you know I don't think it's a trend. I think it's more of a revolution. We're becoming more educated. We we understand what we're putting into our bodies now is more important than ever. I just read a study on USA Today just yesterday saying, you know what is the fastest growing population of diabetics in type two? Guess who? It's young adults below the age of thirty. Mm. So it's becoming an epidemic. Type one diabetes has rose over twenty percent. Type two diabetes, which is uh, eating habits is rose over 30 uh, percent. My wife works in the ER as a physician assistant. What is she what is she seeing coming to the ER? These kids who are morbidly obese before the age of 20, heart heart medications, blood pressure medications, and you know what? It's it's gotten to the point where they almost have to call DCFS, uh, Department of Child and Family Services, on the parents because they are allowing these kids to make these bad food choices which is leading to early onset of diabetes. I work with surgeons all the time. The three types of patients we see 99% of the time is what I call the triad of death. The smoker, the obese, and the diabetic. We see all three in the OR all the time. Mm -hmm. Well, because you have the medical background um, and you work so closely with surgeons, Let's take advantage of the inside track that you have and talk a little bit about the science of why paleo, and you know, you can really call it whatever you want to call it, eating the way food was naturally. So if you know, you're eating fish that is wild caught, forget the farm stuff. Wild caught fish, so you get nice clean omega threes, uh, you know, free range chicken that that's eating a vegetarian diet. So when you're eating their eggs, you're getting these wonderful oh, clean omega threes mm-hmm. and you're eating the protein and oil in a combination that doesn't make your sugar go wild so you you knock out that the sugar cravings what what is the exact science as you see it and and, and I know that uh, and we'll talk a little bit later about your personal transformation you're a guy who lives it and walks the talk what's how does the science work of losing the body fat you know, you know, Jordan, I think uh, before we really tackle that question, I think it's not so much the science behind it. It's the fact that we lost something a long time ago. When we're talking about the paleo diet and hunter-gatherer societies, they were close to their food sources. They went to the streams to c- catch their fish. They went to the fields to collect the wheat to make the bread. Bread is not the enemy. Everybody's going gluten-free, gluten-free. Carbs are not the enemy. It's the process that it took from harvesting to your table, that is the enemy. We don't know what happens. It becomes enriched. So that term is the kiss of death. When they enrich grains, what do they do? They shoot it full of riboflavin. They shoot it full of these nutrients, they call it, when it's just a preservative, preservative agent to keep it on the shelf longer. That's all it is. Mm. So we didn't lose. What we lost was the fact that we don't know, we don't know where food comes from anymore. The food's always been natural. The harvesting's been natural. We know what we need to eat. We just don't like the. We just don't have the time, the inclination, or the resources to be close to our food sources. 
So true. And it, if there's one thing I think that we all take away from this particular podcast would be try to find your food locally. We have a – I'm in Tampa, and we have a local farm called Sweetwater. Mm -hmm. And every Sunday I go there and, and get my eggs, get my meat, get my vegetables, and everything is organic and everything is locally grown. It's a six-acre farm. It's right in the heart of Tampa, and it's wonderful. I want to give a big shout-out to Sweetwater. If you're in Tampa, check them out. It, it's tremendous food. And you're helping the local economy, and you're helping your, your uh, physical ecology. And so it's a double win, and the prices are great too. So it's, uh, it's, it's a huge way to uh, have a double win. Absolutely. You know, we live in a neighborhood where every Saturday and Sunday there's a farmer's market. And we get our fresh vegetables from the farmer's market. They also sell some of uh, the meats that they, you know, slaughtered on their farm naturally, let the chickens graze. My, my ex-nanny used to bring me fresh eggs because she has a farm. She raised chickens. And those eggs, what's the, I didn't even know about this, which is basically those eggs can stay unrefrigerated for weeks at a time. The reason why we refrigerate our eggs, they've been sitting in crates and barrels in a shipping warehouse for months at a time. So we have to refrigerate them to prevent any sort of bacterial infection like salmonella. But these eggs that uh, you know, people have on their farm, they lay out in the field for weeks at a time. But they're eaten eventually. They're just not sitting there for months at a time. So like I said, we lost something when we got away from being close to our food source. I envy those who are on a farm it's a simpler, maybe a more hard way of life, but they're close to their food source. They know what they're eating, and they know exactly, hey, today I'm going to have chicken. It's going to be fresh caught, and I'm going to prepare it exactly the way I want. You know, And I'm guilty of this. My family's guilty of this. Both my wife and I are in the medical field. It's tough. You get home at 7.30 at night. What happens? You've got to eat something quick. Well, you go to the grocery store, and sometimes you can't go to the organic grocery store, so you get processed chicken. And you know what? When you've had natural chicken compared to processed chicken, it cooks differently, it tastes differently, and you can feel it react to your body differently. Mm. You know, it's amazing. I was just thinking that if you follow trends, that we, most of us moved away from the farms, away from the rural areas, and we went to the suburbs and or the city. And, you know, that was the last... 50 or 60 years after World War II. And now you can see a trend of everybody who was that first wave of moving out, which you know were the uh, people who were doing a little bit better financially and wanted, and wanted, you know, they're in the city and they're performing and then their second generation and the third generation. And now you can see that fourth generation actually moving back to the country. You see people who are financially comfortable now actually going out and buying farms. It's like a reverse trend. Absolutely. You know, I, I think, you know, getting back to your, your previous point of kind of tapping into the knowledge of what I see in the OR, I think this all ties together is a lot of times when we see these patients, 99% of the patients are very obese. So when you have obese patients, you have delayed healing because you have to go through all those layers of subcutaneous fat. And fat heals very slowly. Number two, when you cut through that fat, and I don't want to get too graphic, but just to let you know, you can see layers of toxicity. You know who the smokers are. Fat is supposed to be bright, yellow, and vibrant, subcutaneous fat. And these patients we see that are smokers, that fat is a dull yellow color, and you can easily tell this guy's been a smoker for years. Mm. We know there's going to be delayed healing. We know there's going to be a whole host of whole host of problems that we're dealing with. It's not so much the surgery that's the problem, it's the healing process and getting these patients back to goal that's the issue. So we could cut you up all you want and fix these problems, but you healing when you're a smoker, when you're obese, when you're diabetic, that's the problem right there. What is the, what is the actual mechanism in, that's in place that and I can personally attest to when I experiment, and I was a vegan for a long time. The entire time I lived in Los Angeles, I was a vegan, and I felt okay. Nothing, you know, there were no atrocious health issues. I, I certainly didn't feel vibrant, but I was, you know, I n never really went above 180 or 185 when I was a vegan, so I was in decent health. However, when I started experimenting with the paleo program or paleo-like program, 
I went to 165, lean, shredded, insanely strong in the gym, insane amount of energy, no energy dips during the day. My skin cleared up. There were just a lot of real pros, and I can say that the experiment worked for me. Um, I would love if you could really delve into the mechanisms that take place when you reintroduce fish oil and reintroduce omegas and reintroduce uh, that complete amino acid profile. What, what are the mechanisms that take place that do make it perhaps somewhat superior to a vegetarian or vegan profile? I mean, you know, that's that's a great question. What I what I would do is take a step back a little bit further than that, in saying, you know, a vegetarian vegan diet is okay for some people, but where we get into trouble so much is the processing of the food, and namely refined sugars. That's that's really the key. So you felt great on that paleo diet. You're feeling lean and mean. You're feeling you're full of energy, but that paleo diet automatically takes into account one thing, which is you're not taking in a lot of refined sugars. You know, we, we don't even know it. But when I started this journey, I took a calculation of how much sugar I was consuming, and I thought I was doing good, but I was doing horrible, really bad. I mean, I think it was over 80 grams of sugar a day in condiments, in soups, and salads, and dressings, and all these things. So in terms of mechanism of action, I think it's pretty simple when you think about it, and that is if you keep food in its current natural state as much as possible without processing it and adding sugars and refining it with enrichments and riboflavin and all that stuff. I think when you keep food in its whole its natural form, the body is able to strip the protein it needs in a more efficient manner so you get what you need and there's no barriers to you attaining the protein, the fish oils, all those daily things you need to be productive. So is the sugar... Is it you said that it blocks the ability for the protein to be to, for your body to uptake the protein? Is the raising of blood sugar the issue that keeps you from being able to uptake the nutrients and the protein? Well, you know, there's no there's no defined studies on if it's a blocking the mechanism or the pathways, but just from a personal standpoint, from my client standpoint that I work with when we talk about nutrition counseling. Refined sugars, there have been some studies talking about inflammation. They lead to certain inflammation, lower GI tract in the joints, because they are toxins, they're carcinogenic. We shouldn't be consuming 42 grams of sugar in one can of Coke. That's not natural, not by any sort of stretch of the imagination. When you go to whole, whole protein foods, for example, when you, when you eat protein that's not been refined, it's been cooked, you know, as it should, it has been enriched, it hasn't been tampered with. The body is an amazing tool because it works by finding the least path of resistance. What that, what that means is that you eat a good source of protein, you will get all the nutrients from that protein source. You eat a poor source of protein, you go to a McDonald's, you go to any fast food joint that's not using real meat that's organic, that's farm raised, that's sustainable. The body has some issues processing that meat and you may not get the full complements of nutri nutrients that you're trying to get. Hmm. You are a, um, you're a, a coach. Um, not only do you help surgeons uh, in the operating room uh, with surgical techniques, but you also are a coach and you um, one of your specialties is functional medicine. Can you tell us what that is? So, you know, we call it functional fitness. Uh, basically, you know, I work with a lot of clients who have gone through the personal training round. And when person, when you hear the word personal training, you hear the guy, the six-pack abs, the guy who's chiseled, or the female, chiseled, rock-hard beach body. And you think about that, and you look at those people, and you go, that's an amazing goal they've attained, but is that really real realistic for me? If you're 55 years old, is that what you're really shooting for? You know, if you're 30 years old, maybe that's what you want, that's what you're looking for. But functional fitness is ba basically being productive and active in your daily life. We get clients who say, listen, my lower back hurts, I just want to play with my kids. Can you help me attain that goal? You know, my kids are running around me, I want to be able to keep up with them. That's functional fitness. Or from the guy who's the athlete, top level athlete, I need to jump higher, I need to run faster, I need to have more endurance, I need to do all those things that make me an athletic Give me the athletic edge. I need to be competitive. So functional fitness is defined by what's important to you. 
if you want to play with your kids and feel better about yourself, we focus on those things to make you be able to just feel good, feel normal, squat down, play with your kids. If that's your goal, let's help you attain it. If you want to be the top level athlete, you want to run faster, jump higher, well, there's certain steps you can take. You know, diet, exercise, nutrition to attain those goals. So functional fitness, I would define Jordan, is just basically what's important to you, let's achieve those goals, because personal training doesn't really encompass what's the most important issue, which is being able to be functional and active in your daily life. One of the other distinctions that you make is that it's, um, you know, this is not some sort of a, like a short-term fix. It's not something that is just a, you know, like a one-week thing that this is, this is a lifestyle issue. It's a lifestyle change, and it's a fundamental way of thinking. It's a, it's a change of thinking. Can you elaborate on that? Absolutely. I'll share my personal experience with that, and that is when I, probably almost two years ago now, I signed up to get personal training. This journey has been ongoing for me, and I signed up to get a personal training to get a different perspective on things. And, you know, there was a lot of bad personal training advice out there I've seen, but there's one guy in particular I was working with, and he really opened my eyes to diet, and then he took it a step farther. He said, I don't want to see you back here. He goes, I would love to have repeat business, but I don't want to see you back here. I want to give you the tools to take this to the next level. And he said, this is a lifestyle. And if everybody was doing it, it'd be easy, right? You know, there's a few people out there who can just kind of go, hey, I can turn it on. I can go, you know what, I can eat healthy every day. You know what, I'm in surgery. I'm not able to get to a, a meal that's proper, but I'll make sure I have the necessary things there to make sure that I'm eating right, have the energy I need. But lifestyle change is an all-encompassing term. I'm going to sleep better. I'm going to eat healthier. I'm going to do the things that basically make me more productive. You know, all, everything is not just about exercise. Exercise is a small part. I like to kind of break it down into ratios for my clients. 30% exercise, 10% sleep, 60% diet. And when I say that to them, they're like, really? I said, what you put in your body has the most significant effect on what, you, what your outcomes are. You know, it seems fairly obvious, but we don't think about it that terms. And that's why a lifestyle change is taking your life and saying, I'm not productive here and here. Let's figure out what we need to do to change our diet, our exercise, our nutrition to make ourselves productive. Because short-term goals are, I want to have six-pack abs. Okay, that's great, but you may lose them. But if you make lifestyle changes, you can have that six-pack ab and maintain that lifestyle for 10, 20, 30 years. Yeah, and I think that's such an important distinction to make because um, if you think it's a short-term fix or even calling it a diet, I think mm -hmm. is inaccurate. I think this is a way of life, and I can speak to myself with this. Um, I'm now at the stage where I'm having four good days in a row, and then I'll have like a fifth day where I kind of carb out, and but I'm not beating myself up on that day right. five when I do eat carbs and just kind of like it's like a carb bonanza. My body just says, yeah, and I know it's more an addictive thing than it is anything. But, I'm but not you know, you and I have talked about it, Jordan, and that is we need everything. We need the carbs. We need the fats. So don't feel guilty doing it. We yeah. need it, you know? So. Well, that's uh, I thank you for that distinction because I tend to sweep <laughs> over to one side or the other, and I tend to become a warrior about it. It's my mentality. Uh, I do appreciate that distinction and I would much rather think of it as balance because I do notice by day five, day six, I'm pretty much want some carbs pretty badly. When I mm -hmm. do take them, uh, I do feel better. So yeah, to circle back to earlier tonight when we were talking, this is not a diss on veganism or vegetarianism because totally. it served me. It mm -hmm. served me. I mean, when I was initially out in LA and weighing 205 and sick as a dog, and started the vegan lifestyle that got me down to 185, 180, and it got rid of a very important 20 pounds. That that was it served me, no question about it. And like you know, I, I lived on it for a long time, and it was good. It was very functional for me. But like you said, then it's time to bump it up even one more level. You know, the veganism is you know 5,000 times better than what I was doing before that. So and now I bump it up even more, introducing some some clean fish oil and clean eggs and, and I definitely notice it. So now that the new improved from 185, 185 down to 165 mm -hmm. is remarkable. 
It's, it's, it's just like when I talk to my surgeons, and the, the term is they practice medicine. You're never perfected because there, there's always something new to learn. Same thing with the lifestyle change. I'm always tweaking. Hey, this worked for me for two weeks. Guess what? I need to mix it up now. Let's change it up. We talk to our clients and say, okay, how do you feel after two weeks? And they say, I feel good. All right. We don't, want, we don't want you to get bored with what you're doing. Let's mix it up and see what happens. We know how certain things are going to work. We know how certain reactions your body's going to have. But it's just like with any exercise, if you do the same routine over and over, you're going to plateau. You want to mix it up a little bit. And I can, uh, I can personally attest to the fact that you do that because uh, a couple of weeks ago, you and I covered the UFC uh, when they were in Orlando. And... Uh, that's where you live, and and I stayed with you during the show, and got to watch your uh, your breakfast, your lunch, and your dinner for a few days, and you definitely live it. And man, do you have some good dishes uh, that you cook up? And and correct me if I'm wrong, but did you put your recipes anywhere that we could the public could see them? Absolutely, yeah. We have a website. Uh, it's more of a it's an education portal. It's a great it's a great way to reach out to us. It's called www.teamnoexcusesfitness.com, and on that website we've got our tips of the week, our recipes of the week, and you know what? We try to mix it up. Meaning we'll go paleo one week. We'll go. We may put a vegetarian dish up one week because everybody, every diet, every lifestyle has a merit, and we don't want to discount anything. Absolutely. So give us one of your average days. You get up and what do you eat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner? So typically, you know, I, I, breakfast being the most important meal of the day, we've heard this as kids, you know, and I think we all just kind of laugh about it. It's like, my God, you know, we've been hearing this for 30 years. But you know what? There's truth in this. There actually is. I used to be the guy who didn't eat breakfast, but now it's my most important meal. So for breakfast, I'll eat maybe three or four eggs. And you know what? I, I include the yolks. Why are the yolks important? Because yolks contain cholesterol, which we, we understand is bad for you, but in moderation, cholesterol is a precursor to hormones. So everybody obviously has endogenous hormones in their body and helps in the regulation of hormones. So basically cholesterol creates the hormones in your body. They're the precursor, and a certain amount of cholesterol is healthy and natural. Absolutely. So I contain the yolks so it can basically, you know, just dribble down to as many yolks and as many egg whites as I want to eat. About four or five of those eggs, I take a whole wheat English muffin, throw some unsalted fresh ground almond butter or peanut butter, throw some Celtic sea salt. The reason why I use Celtic sea salt is because it helps uh, in decreasing the amount of water I retain and it contains all the natural trace min minerals. It's not bleached, it's naturally farmed. And I throw a little bit of honey. Honey's great because it adds a little bit of sweetness and also doesn't really affect glycemic index too much as well. And then some black coffee. You know, I think sharing a personal story is that uh, my wife is addicted to coffee, and she's been on her own personal journey, and she's she hit a wall, and she said, I'm just not losing what I want to lose. And so we took an inventory of her food, and we said, what's the X factor? And what we found was she was having six cups of coffee a day with cream and sugar. That's what we found. And so how do we eliminate that? Well, try it black. You will actually taste it. It'll taste pretty good. It takes a little bit of getting used to, but one cup of coffee, black, eight calories versus cream and sugar. You can bump that sucker up to 140, 150, easy. So you want to you want to keep it clean, keep it natural. So that's my first breakfast, and then right about that's about 8 a.m. Right about 9:30, I'm ready to go eat again. And I think the biggest benefit of this lifestyle is you get to eat more. I mean, isn't that? Dude, I watched you eat, man. <laughs> Calories. Oh my God, the amount of food we consumed in four days was insane. And you know what? I lost a pan size. That's that was the best part, right? <laughs> that it's was amazing. I mean, that's kind of like that. Really tells the story right there that we consumed so much nutrition and so much nutrient dense dense food, and yet. I was getting more and more lean, more and more shredded, stronger and stronger in the gym. It really, I mean, it's a strong case is made. A strong case is made. If you keep losing fat and keep increasing lean body mass to fat ratio, oh, yeah. while you're eating calories, so you're getting more nutrition, 
uh, woo, strong case made for that lifestyle. Absolutely, and you know, to get back to your point of what I ate for breakfast is, you know, I keep it simple. You know, you got to be realistic. You can't make a gourmet meal for breakfast. We all have jobs. We all have to get up. We all have our daily life. We have kids. You know what? Eggs are easy to make. Throw a whole wheat toast in there. Do whatever works for you. Make it the biggest meal of your day. Make it an enjoyable meal, something you really look forward to when you wake up. That's where I look at breakfast. And you know what? When I'm done eating breakfast, I'm like, I'm ready to go, knock out what I have to do, ready to take on the world. And you know what? Don't be afraid of carbs. Carbs are great for brain activity in the morning. You need those carbs. You and I have talked about this because you shy away from the carbs a little bit. But I tell you to come back to them in the morning. If you're going to do carbs, do them in the morning. Throw some oatmeal in there. But, you know, honestly, breakfast, I look forward to it. I think it's, like, very enjoyable. You're getting a good start to the day. And then now I'm going to work on meal number two, three, four, five, and six. I have to look forward to. The more clean I eat, the more I'm able to eat, the more weight I'm losing. You know what came to my mind when you said that is when you adopt this as a lifestyle, then food starts to become your slave rather than you being a slave to food. So the food now serves you. Absolutely. Rather than you serving the food. Uh, and that is what really becomes exciting is you're using the food now as a tool. You, you, you're, you've lost your cravings and now you're using it as a tool to become a better person, a stronger person, a more clear-headed person, uh, a, a person in a better mood. Uh, you know, that's another thing that I didn't even talk about was is my mood has been picking up on this. I don't know if that's the vitamin A or the vitamin D. I'm definitely, you know, we're both in Florida. We get lots of sunshine. We're very lucky in that regard. Um, I, or it's a combination of, of, of all of it. Absolutely. No, and that's, you know, that's the other point I'm glad you brought up, Jordan, was the other thing we work with our clients and just with our, you know, one my personal journey is the mental aspect of food. And that is one of the most important things to identify is how people feel when they eat certain foods, emotional eating is what I call it. And a lot of times we, we, we try to gauge that by doing a food log, but I also ask my clients, how did you feel when you eat, ate that? And it's really interesting to see if what they think they're eating is healthy compares to how they're feeling. Like my chocolate lovers, they feel like on cloud nine eating chocolate. It's that sugar. But you know what? Moreover, food is tied to memory. You know, it's very cultural, especially coming from a cultural background as, as mine, as being Indian. You know what? Food equals love. That's how, that's how my mom showed her love. That's how our aunts and daughters and wives, they show love by making their food. And if you don't eat, you don't, they don't think they, you, you're accepting their love. So when you go to their house and you don't clean your plate and ask for seconds, you're insulting them. <laughs> say that you know, especially when I lived uh, in Los Angeles and I was a vegetarian, I ate a lot of Indian. And Absolutely. And one of my favorite, favorite uh, culturals for for meals. Uh, it, it, I don't know. I could eat Indian buffet like every day of the week. Mm -hmm. um, so the flavor is there, but you were saying you have to be super careful with the Indian food because it's uh, bad oil and very high and a lot of sugars and a lot of carbs. Well, it's a lot, you know, because of the lack of protein in some of the Indian foods, we have, you know, they use a lot of oil for cooking and frying and things of that nature. Um, and it's just a lot of carbs. It's a lot of white rice, which is not the best thing in the world. It's so funny. My father-in-law, we, we went to an Indian restaurant and I, and I said, hey, why don't you make one small change? Instead of white rice, eat brown rice. He literally was ready to punch me because that, that's insulting to him. He grew up with white rice his whole life. It's so cultural. It's so endearing. It's tied to them emotionally. And I think that emotional attachment to food is more important to address than just the physiological need because the mind controls the body. And if the mind says yes, your body is going to come in line. Guaranteed. Mm. You know, one of the more interesting studies I read was that uh, sugar we talked about. The body process, the brain processes sugar, as heroin addicts process heroin in the brain the exact same way. Wow! So it becomes an extremely addictive substance. Yeah, you know, uh, sugar is a whole thing, isn't it? And it's, um, uh, you know, I still wrestle with it. Um, you know, I've got it about probably 80% out of my diet, and then I'll go periods where it's 100%. I'll go six months 
where I get it 100% out, and then I'll have you know a relapse. I'll have a two-week binge. It just gets ugly. Um, you know, I admit it. It's it's <laughs> it really tells me just how nasty and how insidious sugar is. There's a uh, great video uh, on on YouTube right now. You probably, I bet a lot of our viewers have seen this because it's it's gotten in the millions. Uh, and he's up to three or four million hits. Dr. Uh, Robert Lustig, a very prestigious physician in California, mm -hmm. talking about how uh, poisonous sugar is. And if you watch that video, he goes into the science of how I mean, it is literally a poison in the body. The body has n no idea, zero idea what to do with that substance. It is horrible. It's right, Like you said, it's right up there with heroin. Absolutely. You know, and you and I had many discussions about when reading food labels, for example. That's a big thing. And as we were taught in school, check the fat, protein, and carbohydrates. And then also de dive deeper into the fat and go, what's saturated, what's polyunsaturated, and what's saturated. Well, I think there should be a movement, and we should lead the charge on this, which is fat and sugar should be number two, front and center on that label, saying how many grams of sugar is in that can of Coke, it's in that pizza, it's in that soup. You'd be shocked and amazed that sugar goes unnoticed because a lot of my clients go, well, I eat fruits and veggies all the time. I said, okay, well, think about this. Sugar is sugar. You have a plate full of fruit at 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock at night. That is natural sugar, but you're eating, consuming large quantities of it right now. What do you think your body's going to do? Mm. It's not going to burn it at night because that's when we wind down. It's going to store it. That's why we tell our clients, eat sugar in the morning. Your body has been going through a fast. That's why it's called breakfast, to break that fast. And it's going to consume that sugar quickly and burn it. So one key thing to keep in mind is that sugar content. And one visualization I give to my clients all the time is who are addicted to soda, because God knows I was, and I thank God I've been, I'm off of it, is I tell them, a can of your favorite soda, Coke, Pepsi, whatever, average about 42 grams of sugar. Now, when you think of 42 grams, it's hard to visualize sugar at 42 grams, right? So what do we do? We take 42 sugar cubes, put it in a cup. Each, each sugar cube is, weighs one gram. And I tell my clients, that's what you're ingesting. If that doesn't strike a tone, nothing will. Mm. Well, the time goes quickly um, when you have a great <laughs> guest and there's great subject matter. There's a lot more I wanted to get to. Absolutely. Um, and in time constraints, we're definitely going to have you back. We'll have you back in uh, in short order. Lots of other things I wanted to ask you about, you know, traveling because we both are on the road a lot. And how do you travel as a very clean paleo type person or just clean living type person? A lot of other things we want to get to, but we're we're out of time. Any quick closing thoughts before we wrap up, Sanjay? No, I I think this is a great program, great platform, and just our friendship has. Uh, really introduced me what a public service you do and I, I know you're going to have some amazing guests on board and I look forward to the next time being on your show. But uh, for anybody who's interested in learning more about what we do, just go to our website at www.teamnoexcusesfitness.com, all one word, and you can get some great tools, contact us, we'll reach out to you. We always like to help people out. And we'll put that information about Sanjay on the show notes, uh, his web, uh, his Twitter feed, all the contact information. If you want to find out more about this great guy, Sanjay Raja, thank you so much for being with us today. Absolutely, Jordan. Thanks, and I look forward to the next time we're on, we're on the show. You are listening to For the Fighter in You, United Fight Alliance, For the Fighter in You. Listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Podbean, Spotify, and Amazon Music. Watch us on NBC Sports Network, CW and ABC, and the United Fight Alliance YouTube channel.